Hello and welcome back to the ROY channel, the channel that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. And as promised today, going to be looking at something uh, dedicated entirely to the energy sector. So we've got a lot to talk about, a lot of uh, charts to get through, a lot of data to crunch. And so I hope that you enjoy it. If you haven't already liked and subscribed, I would greatly appreciate you doing so. And if you're new to the channel, I am a popular investor on eToro. I'm also a... Uh, I also have a derivatives book that I manage outside of eToro, completely separate, uh, that is private. eToro has been uh, a hell of a lot of fun for me and I, I continue to really enjoy it. I think it's a great platform. Today, we're going to be talking about the sector in which I am most bullish, and that is, of course, the energy sector. We're going to be talking about supply, demand, mainly around oil, but also uh, touching on natural gas. And of course, uranium, uh, we'll touch on slightly, mainly dedicated to the oil uh, because we have seen uh, some some big changes. Okay, so news. I'm uh, a little bit trigger happy on the keyboard today. So what's happened recently? So we've had Putin turning off the taps to Europe. Okay, so Nord Stream 1 is closed for maintenance. Will it come back on? We don't know. Um, the energy has been used as a weapon of war. Uh, that was always going to happen. And so we, to cut a long story short, we've shot ourselves in the foot over here in the West by reducing our own energy independence, depending more on the East. And that's all well and good, provided that we all get along. When we don't get along, that can be a problem. USA natural gas production has been flat to declining. Um, we've been, um, we, I shouldn't say we, the, the US has been saved in terms of their natural gas price at Henry Hunt because of the uh, Freeport disaster, which has meant that about two and a half billion um, uh, cubic feet, metric cubic feet has been um, saved uh, instead of being exported overseas has been kept for domestic consumption. Okay, that will not last. And so eventually by the end of the year, I'm expecting we have this conversion to some degree between US prices and prices in the rest of the world, particularly Europe and Asia. Fed's got a meeting in about two weeks. Uh, will we see a 75 bit rise? Will it be 100 bit? Will it be 50 bit? We don't know, but they will continue their uh, one two combo of tightening and raising rates at the same time. Biden just met with MBS over the weekend. Um, the Saudis have said that they might add another million dollars, uh, another million barrels a day. In terms of supply, will that be enough? I don't think so. Continuing that demand will continue to rise and we're already uh, looking at deficits, uh, including SBR being released. The SBR will run out around about October and so it will need to be repleted. Uh, I don't buy some of the arguments that I see online saying that the SBR doesn't need to be replenished. I think that's, I think that's crazy. I don't understand how that works. And so there we have it uh, with Russian oil starting to come Offline, as of August, I do believe, we are going to start to see this deficit um, continue to widen. Gas, as above, same thing applies, plus Freeport is due to come back online in December, which I believe will increase the price at Henry Hub. Okay. This window will see huge demand for fossil fuels as Russian gas molecules simply won't be there. I think three to five million barrels per day in addition to oil demand. Coal will remain bid and probably see a new all-time high. As soon as Freeport comes back, US natural gas prices will rise again as Europe and Asia both desperately compete for the same volumes. It's been taken from HFI research. Uh, we will touch on some more of those guys' work uh, later on in a future slide. News, we've had Germany's largest landlord reduce heating for tenants to save energy. So things are getting super tight in Germany. They have uh, lowered their lofty standards when it comes to sulfur uh, concentration in coal. Normally they uh, were taking in the very light grade. Now they're taking basically anything they can get because they're so desperately needed. So every single sign that I can see out there points to tightening supplies when it comes to energy markets. Tightening supplies where we can't... Uh, when we come to US dollars, yes, it, it is there and that is slowing down some purchasing demand, but that cannot last forever for reasons which I mentioned in the last video and in various others. So if I uh, rehash this slide that I've already shown before, if I raid Eric Nuttall's Twitter, it's the best place to find these charts. That's why I do it. Uh, if you don't have a, a Bloomberg or if you don't have access to TradingView. So there are times when the financial demand for oil implodes while the physical demand for oil remains strong. This is one of those times. 
Tune out the noise, the market remains undersupplied. SPR, Strategic Petroleum Reserve, ends in three months. China will unlock one day and OPEC spare capacity exhaustion cometh. So that's probably more eloquent than, my, than the way I said it in the previous slide, but uh, I'm in agreement with all of those. I mean, the SPR is not infinite. It has to run out. China will start to unlock once Xi Jinping is expected to be named uh, for a further term. So essentially chairman for life in China. And so then you will have demand scraping the, the bottom of the barrel, literally, and demand starting to um, stack up on the other side of the equation. So this is just really, really bizarre to see the sell-off that we've had in oil producers. And I think it's an opportunity personally, and I'll be continuing to add. Chart on the left is a surplus deficit versus the uh, four-year average, okay? So here we are towards the end of July down here, and you can see we're in a large deficit compared to what we would normally expect as a four-year average. On the right, that is the spread, okay? Front month versus back month for Brent. So here you can see, if you want to think of it this way, the higher the number, the higher the, the time premium, the more urgent it is for traders uh, or buyers in general to get their hands on that oil here and now. Okay, so if you have a lower spread, that means there's less of a, a difference between the front month and the next month, meaning that there's less urgency in terms of when you will take delivery of the, the product. Okay, and I should say before I move on, the highs been as high as 7.5. Uh, you can see the spike over here, that'd be this big fella. Uh, second highest spike is what we saw at the end of June, where we were touching on uh, six as a spread. And the last price was four, okay? Over the average of 2.3, okay? So we're a long way over the average, which means, uh, which is a, another piece of evidence to suggest that supply is still very tight in these physical markets of so actually taking uh, delivery. Okay. I did say there are a lot of charts, okay? So bear with me. Uh, HFI Research are really great to follow. If you don't already follow them, you can follow them or you can Google them. You can follow their sub stack. They have some great stuff. <clears throat> and I thought that I'd, I'd take some of uh, their charts and put them in today because I just thought that, that they were brilliant. So if we look at storage, here's what you can see on the left that's remained flat, mainly due to the SPR being released, I believe would be the, the main factor. Otherwise I'd see it start to, to drop. That would be my expectation. If you look at storage change versus the five-year average, which is the chart on the right here, you can see we're in large deficits. So if you look uh, June um, weekly, okay, as of June 10 through to where we are uh, just finishing second week of July, okay, the chart finishes on the first week of July, you can see the storage draws, okay, so that's stored oil leaving, okay, supply being put onto the market which means it needs to be replenished. If we take a look at demand supply, breaking down their numbers, okay, a, a few key points. Here we look at crude exports. Exports have dropped, and that makes sense because oil supplies are getting quite tight in the US. They're going to export less and keep more for domestic production. That's a trend I'd expect to see in most places around the world. And you look at refinery throughput, so how much oil can go through the refineries. Supply, US production, crude imports, okay, and then the SPR. So if we take a look at the weekly numbers here, what you can see at first glance, it would look like demand is less than the supply. But if you take SPR out, they're about at equilibrium. Not forgetting the fact that the SPR will need to be replenished. So essentially what you could do is take SPR out of the equation and supply demand would remain balanced, meaning... Um, we'd, we'd continue to keep the current level of deficit, assuming that demand didn't rise or fall um, moving forwards. But then don't forget that 7 million barrels weekly will be added back to the demand side because you need to replenish um, the SPR. And so unfortunately, what I think is going to happen or what is likely to happen is that SPR will be released onto the market at the times when oil has been fairly high but then once you, once the market realizes that things really are just so tight, oil prices start to rise again, 
the US may have to buy back that oil at higher prices than that at which they sold. I mean, that's what it's looking like. We'll see what happens. Same deal here, we're measuring uh, the stocks, okay, uh, versus the five year range and where we are as a weekly uh, reported number. Again, um, you can see we're right down in the lower ranges there. So I've said that uh, a number of times. I don't think I need to, to beat a dead horse there. And so where is this coming from? Is it because um, has the recent sell-off in oil price, for instance, been because there's a heap of new production coming online? No, quite the opposite. So imports have dropped, okay. And on the right side, you can see that domestic production is higher than where it was in 2020, but that's because nothing was happening in 2020. Uh, so that's not exactly... Uh, you know, that's not exactly anything to, to cheer about. And we're starting to hit a flattening in production, okay? This needs to rise in order to start to make a dent into the deficit, and it's just not. Exports, okay, yep, they can, uh, US that is, can reduce their exports. It will give a little bit more leftover for uh, domestic production, if that makes sense. But again, uh, once you hit zero, you can't have you know, negative, it just all goes to domestic production and it will continue to, to eat into the, the supply deficit. Here's a great chart, uh, again from Substack, I believe Saad Khan's Pale Blue Dot, which is a really, really interesting read. So plug to, to Saad. Um, I'd like to do an interview with him actually if he's available because I think that he's just got a really interesting insight into global markets as they currently stand. Blue lines are storage in the sense of, um, not storage, excuse me, demand in terms of um, aggregate barrels. And the red, uh, the orange line trending is demand growth. So it's the derivative. So what we need to understand here is that demand and demand growth are not the same things. If you hear Adich Asani or Eric Nuttall talk about when we go into recession, we don't actually have demand contraction. We have Contraction in the growth of demand, meaning the rate of change at which demand is increasing, may retract. But it's actually very rare that you see the overall aggregate of uh, demand in terms of barrels, okay, actual physical energy requirement almost never goes backwards. So if we move, this is going all the way back into the 80s, okay? So if we use this little dip here was around uh, the dot-com bubble, we have increasing demand with the electrification of things and the globalization of um, emerging markets, essentially getting more access to um, different utensils that use more energy. Then we have a dip, if you follow my cursor here, that was 2008 with the GFC, okay? So major catastrophic uh, event, you can see demand growth absolutely retracted to negative 2%. I'm, I'm assuming they do this as a year on year rate of change, but the aggregate really only just dipped. I mean, instead of having four, um, 4 million in terms of barrels a day growth, I believe, um, doesn't actually specify, but I'm assuming that's what it is, contract a little bit, and then the next year, you're using the same amount of barrels that you were or more. So you may have the rate of change reducing, but what that does to overall aggregate barrels may, not, may mean very little. And as population continues to grow, particularly in emerging markets, you have that double whammy that I've spoken so often about where not only is population growing, but the amount of energy used per person in a growing number, you know, the number of people are also growing, hitting that S curve uh, is accelerating. And so you can have a situation such that this yellow line looks fairly anemic or weak, but those blue bars continue to push higher and higher out to um, over the next few decades. Here you can see COVID uh, drop the demand overall, um, but very, very rare. And um, so if you have the whole world shut down and you only drop the aggregate demand um, by that amount, you know, why is everyone expecting demand to contract to such a degree uh, on recession fears? doesn't make any sense. Will demand growth reduce? Well, certainly I would expect that if you have a recession that growth um, and demand growth should, should stall and retract. But the overall, there's a, there's a certain flaw that you hit that you just, you can't go below or else you start to go back towards the stone age, literally. Okay, 
very, very uh, interesting uh, commentary leading up to this weekend's uh, conversation between Biden and Mohammed bin Salman. Goldman Sachs have been targeting anywhere up to three hundred dollar um, effective oil price, so WTI plus uh, crack spreads, which is what you're paying for at the pump. So you're not paying the WTI price. You're you can have a, a an oil price as a future price at one uh, particular level, but then you may be paying well above that depending on what's happening at the refineries. Okay, so Goldman have put all sorts of different prices out there. Everyone was giving them a bit of stick because they thought they were way too high in their estimates. Goldman's put out an adverse scenario. And what might that look like? So that will look like no Russian production decline, which we are not expecting. Sanctions kick in, I believe, at the end of August. So by the end of the year, and it's kind of funny that, right? Like Europe was basically expecting the war to be over by now so that they <laughs> they could continue their reliance on Russian energy. But anyway, that's the subject for another day. If Russian production doesn't go away and it continues to come online. Plus you've got the Saudis and uh, the Emiratis adding another half a million barrels a day. They've said they'll add another million barrels today uh, per day, if they can, uh, that remains to be seen, but MBS says he'll up it from 12 million to 13 barrels a day. That's been news after this was uh, tweeted, plus European recession, plus global GDP declines at half of what Europe does still equal a fair value target. This is GS's target of $110 for Brent in 2023 uh, versus Canadian energy stocks discounting $50 at the moment. Okay, so we've got a big margin of safety. Even uh, if you disagree with Goldman's thesis and you're saying if all the above happens and you think that all well, price prices are going to go down to maybe $70, $75 WTI, well, you've still got this incredible margin of safety in most of the stocks that are where I personally am most heavily invested. Um, not so much in eToro, um, but in my personal portfolio, I have my largest position in Meg Energy and I, I'm extremely exposed to the Canadian oil sands plays because I think that they represent a, an incredible opportunity. Hopefully I'm right because there's a lot of money on the line for me. Okay, so we're going to change gears and talk about gas again. This comes from HFI's research. Uh, highly suggest you subscribe. They're really great in terms of what they put out uh, for content. Uh, I've taken, I tried to keep this really concise, but it was just so good. I had to put all this, all this stuff in. So at the end of the day, where we are in this back half of 2022, here's a good way to think about the US gas market. So total demand year on year is going to be up to about 7.3 billion cubic feet a day. Supplies have only been up about 3 billion cubic feet a day. Huge deficit, a humongous deficit. Then when you think about exports coming back online by the latest, maybe December, Freeport gets uh, rebuilt and open for business, you're going to be chewing into that available supply available for the US. So usually Freeport can do about 2, 2.5 uh, billion cubic feet a day. So you, instead of this number being a three, it might be 0.5, okay, or one. So the, the, that spread will start to widen, which will put um, higher demand uh, or high pressure on gas prices locally in the US. And that's, again, part of why my thesis is that the US gas price has to converge closer to uh, the price that the rest of the world is paying. In order for the US gas market to be in surplus, okay, so if I invert that and say what would have to happen for that not to occur, the lower 48 states uh, production would need to increase by 4.3 billion uh, cubic feet a day at a minimum. And that isn't going to happen. Okay, I, don't, I can't imagine a scenario in which that's going to happen. This is not even including the fact that LNG exports are down by 2 billion. So that's the, the figure that I mentioned from Freeport. So if you put that together, US gas production needs to increase by another 6.3 billion cubic feet a day, okay? Um, I just, uh, most people tell me that can't happen and I have no reason to disagree with them. To make matters worse, by next year, LNG export increases along with the other demand factors will push demand higher by another 2.5 billion cubic feet a day. So not only are you having this huge impediment to supply, but demand is growing on the top line. Again, that spread starts to widen. 
This means by next year, we would need the lower 48 production to be somewhere close to 9 billion. So 8.8 .8 billion cubic feet a day higher than where it currently is. Okay, so basically doubling the entire uh, production in gas, which is why uh, I really have good exposure uh, in eToro portfolio. We have XOP and uh, I also own, um, in other portfolios that I manage, I own plays like Sandridge, and uh, I think that that really, that little fella could, could rip to the upside. Okay. Okay. If you look at nine point partners breaking down a bearish scenario. So let's say oil falls to $70 WTI. If you use uh, the natural gas strip, which we just mentioned is probably or most likely understated. And we assume no changes in Forex what would the free cash flow yield be like based on today's prices, okay? And you're looking at an average free cash flow yield of 19% for these names mentioned down the bottom, okay? Which is just unbelievable, like just unbelievable. So we can essentially have, um, I've done my modeling on $100 WTI and we've closed just below, call it $100. So when you think about it, if you have a 30% pullback in the commodity price, at today's prices, you're still getting an average. If you're looking at these names and you assume these inputs are correct, I can make no guarantee. You have to do the work. You would assume an average free cash flow yield of 90%, which is just phenomenal. And if you, if you forget all the noise and you just said, oh, I've got an investment, and we expect the demand of, of what the company sells to continue to grow. These companies are going to be debt free. We expect by this year or next year, the first quarter next year at the latest. They have, in some cases, decades worth of inventory on the books, and they're trading at a free cash flow yield expected of around 19% bare case scenario. I mean, are you interested in that? Personally, yes, I am. Um, and so you have to invert and say, what can go wrong? Well, obviously the oil price can drop. That's one thing. How far can it drop given the, the supply deficits? It'll be interesting to see. Um, but if you're pricing in as these companies are $50 WTI with, you, with decades of inventory on the books, uh, in most cases, not all, but Meg's case, I know that, that they have several decades worth that I believe at the price I bought them, I'm getting for free and I'm getting still a 90% free cash flow yield if the price um, of oil drops to WT $70 WTI. I just don't think there's that much left for me to think about. And that's just me personally, okay? If you wanted to go further out the risk curve, you can look at say Antero Resources, more exposure to gas, unhedged, um, which I really like. I also like um, Sandridge I mentioned, but Journey Energy, which is a tiny little, uh, little small cap up in Canada. Okay. Out of all these, while we're here, what do I own? Meg's my biggest exposure. I do own uh, Callum Petroleum in both portfolios. Uh, Enna Plus I own quite a lot of. Ovintiv a tiny bit. And um, you also get exposure to Antero uh, through the XOP. So if you're following the Toro portfolio, you get exposure to a lot of these plays based on the ETF that I've chosen to go with, okay? Um, Synovus, we own outright and, um, you know, a, a few of the others, okay? They, they just all look really juicy to me. What can I say? What are our targets? Again, using $100 WTI, this chart has done all the work for me, so I don't need to reinvent the wheel here. You're paying an average multiple of 2.1 times free cash flow, okay? You, assuming these inputs are true and correct, okay? What could we be seeing on an upside at a six times multiple for something like Meg? If you look at the video, you'll know why I think that that's certainly um, reasonable to expect. We're getting, uh, well, I'm getting, uh, should this play out, uh, a huge return on investment. Okay, so more than, a, more than a double with decades of inventory, essentially for free at double digit free cash flow yields. That's the way that I look at it. Uh, some of these little fellas down the bottom here, uh, CPG, Crescent Point, they still have some hedges. Uh, I do own a little bit of that. Baytex, I like, I own a bit of that. And I own CPE. I'm a big fan of CPE. Uh, Oventive, not as big a fan, but it's very cheap. And Anna Plus. So those are the others with more exposure to the US that I really like. 
So verdict, uh, you know, if, if you haven't got any cash, I guess that you just hold and sit tight. Um, that's what I would do. Personally, I'm buying. Okay, I'm scaling in, using options. Um, I think it's a good time. If you can remember Stanley Druckenmiller's advice of looking out at 12 to 18 months and seeing what you think the most underpriced assets are, not now, but in 12 or 18 months. And that's what I believe to be the case. I think that these are some of the most... Uh, underappreciated uh, opportunities out there along with uranium. I'm very comfortable. Um, modern portfolio theory um, is not something to which I'm adhering personally because uh, I go where the value is. I'm comfortable with a 40% weighting. Um, it's a lot higher than that in my crisis arbitrage and the investments portfolio, which is eToro, it's capped at about 40% and I've got about 20% in cash. Russian supply coming offline in August. Query, if that happens, that'll be very bullish. Easing of QT, if uh, Luke Roman is right and the Fed needs to ease QT by August, um, that'll be very, very interesting. I think this thing will explode to the upside. And we're already starting to see the idea of stimulus checks come out in places like California, of course, where else, uh, to ease with gas prices. All that's going to do is bolster up demand while supply is still in deficit, leading to higher energy prices. So that's it, guys. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Leave a comment in the comments section. If you haven't already liked and subscribed, I'd love for you to do that. If you've got suggestions for guests for me to up my ante and actually buy a decent setup and do the whole podcast thing, I'll be looking at doing that and getting a bit bored and looking to do some stuff with my free time eToro portfolio, uh, you can add me to a watch list or you can uh, copy the portfolio if you wish. Just click on the link that I'll leave in the description. And of course, the disclaimer, guys, I don't know your circumstances. I'm not a financial advisor. This channel is just an outlet for me, a creative outlet to give my opinion. None of this is advice. It's just my opinion and what I'm doing. It doesn't make it right, number one, and it doesn't necessarily make it right for you. So please bear that in mind. Uh, don't make any decisions based off what you hear um, in anything that I do or say or any presentation, you must do your own due diligence, speak to your own qualified advisor and take responsibility for your own actions. Having said that, of course, I hope that you enjoyed it and I look forward to catching up with you in another video soon.